You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Pakistani court commutes death sentence of key accused in 2002 journalist murder case. India brings back the bodies of three Sikhs killed in Kabul attack. Pakistan using legislations as instrument of repression in illegally occupied Gilgit Baltistan. And Pakistan three times more dangerous to humanity than Syria, says Oxford report. A Pakistani court has overturned the death sentence and murder conviction of a British-born Islamist terrorist for the slaying of journalist Daniel Pearl in Karachi in 2002. Pearl, a former South Asian bureau chief of the journal, had been kidnapped in January 2002 and killed after a month in Karachi when he was researching on a story about religious extremism, a report. A Pakistani court has commuted the death sentences of the main person accused in the 2002 kidnapping and murder of Wall Street Journal reporter Daniel Pearl and acquitted three co-accused in the matter. The court exonerated all four, including the key accused, British-born Ahmad Umar Saeed Sheikh, better known as Sheikh Umar, declaring that the prosecution had failed to prove the case against them. An anti-terrorism court had sentenced to death prime accused Ahmad Umar Saeed Sheikh, commonly known as Sheikh Umar, and life term to co-accused Fahad Naseem Salman Saqib and Sheikh Adil for the abduction of the slain journalist. Pakistan was never very enthusiastic about this case anyway. I mean, it was under immense international pressure that Pakistan had to arrest these people, bring them to trial. And uh, then, because the glare of the world was on Pakistan, given the enormity of this particular crime, um, the courts in Pakistan, of course, had to deliver a verdict. And given the evidence at hand, the only verdict they could deliver was a guilty verdict. And given the enormity of the crime, the only uh, sentence possible was an execution. However, and Pakistan plays this game very well, A, they ensured that the trial had dragged on for a sufficient long period of time for people to either lose interest or attention to be dragged away. And then <clears throat> they kept on delaying the sentence through various means. And now it has come to a particular point where they have judged that the international opinion has generally forgot about this entire case. Sheikh Omar was widely seen as having links to Pakistan's top intelligence service, the ISI, as well as Al-Qaeda and had a role in forming the jaish e muhammad terrorist group that carried out attacks in Kashmir during the 1990s. His arrest and conviction in 2002 came in quick succession at a time when Pakistan was under severe pressure from the United States to eliminate terror networks operating on its soil. But the Pakistani judiciary has sat on his appeal for nearly two decades and some observers believe that the present ruling has come at a time when the mood in the US and the rest of the world has changed and nobody seems to be worried about the terrorist of the past. They have decided to A. Reduce the sentence to seven years which basically means he gets away scot-free. Why has Pakistan done this? Look. All these people who are involved in this particular gruesome incident are actually agents of the Pakistan deep state. These are the people that the Pakistan deep states have employed from time to time to do their nefarious activities. After all, who was this particular gentleman? He was in an Indian prison. He was fomenting terrorism in India. Now, look, we basically let go of this particular person in Afghanistan and there he landed up in Pakistan. And then he had a big hand in the beheading of Daniel Pearl. So, all these people are agents of the Pakistani deep state. And obviously, the Pakistani deep state knows that 
throwing them under the bus after they have done their dirty work is going to reduce its credibility among its various agents. The investigation led by Paul's colleague Asra Ansari, who had accompanied him during his Pakistan visit, claimed that the actual man behind his abduction and beheading was Khalid Sheikh Muhammad, the self-proclaimed mastermind of 9-11 terrorist attacks on Washington and New York. Muhammad, who was arrested by Pakistani security forces and handed over to the U.S. in 2003, is currently awaiting trial at the U.S. base in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. A pall of gloom descended over three Sikh families as mortal remains of their relatives who were killed in the terrorist attack in Afghanistan were brought back to India. Recently, the Islamic State launched a fatal attack on a Sikh religious shrine in Kabul, killing at least 25 people and injuring several others, a report. The streets of Ludhiana city of Punjab resonated with the sound of cries, some loud and some stifled, as bodies of three Sikhs killed in a terrorist attack at a religious complex in Afghanistan were brought and handed over to their families in India. In the attack, over 25 worshippers were killed, including three Indians, and several others were injured when a heavily armed suicide bomber stormed a prominent Gurudwara of Kabul in one of the deadliest attacks on the minority Sikh community in the war-torn country. The bodies of the deceased Sardar Jeevan Singh and Sardar Shankar Singh were handed over to their families in northern Ludhiana city of India, while the family of the third deceased, Tian Singh, is based in Indian capital of New Delhi. तो सुबह रोज मरा की तरह जैसे रोज जाते हैं उस दिन भी गए हैं गुरुद्वारा साहब और साथ साढ़े सात बजे एक दम अटैक हुआ है और अटैक के साथ सरदार जीवन सिंह और मेरे चाचे का लड़का सरदार शंकर सिंह उनके अलावा कई और पंद्रह सोलह बंदे और गुजरे हैं टोटल पच्चीस छब्बीस बंदे वहां गुजर गए उसके बाद बम कांड इन्होंने किया बम फेंका उसके साथ दीवार लेंटर टूट गया छत का और बीच में कई बच्चे दब गए Sikhs and Hindus, religious minorities in Afghanistan, have suffered immensely from persecution during the decades of war in the country. Many of them have left Afghanistan because of war and rising crime, and others are living in a constant shadow of fear. This terrorist attack has yet again highlighted the continuous decimation of Sikh and other religious minorities of Afghanistan. और जब दरबार साहब के अंदर मैं हमला होया इस कार्यक्रम कार्यक्रम पर बम सपोर्ट होया और बम सपोर्ट के साथ में ये बंदे मारे गए। As news of the attack first broke, Taliban spokesman Zabihullah Mujahid tweeted. that Taliban was not involved in the attack. However, in less than one week of this gruesome attack, another such incident followed where a roadside bombing in southern Afghanistan on 1st April killed at least eight civilians, including six children and wounded two others. No one immediately claimed responsibility for the attack, but both the Taliban and the Islamic State militants are active in the province. Previously, the Taliban signed a peace agreement on February 29, 2020 that calls for the full withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan within 14 months. After signing the peace deal with the United States, the group has been under pressure to reduce violence and enter into talks with the Afghan government, but the Islamic State has continued its attacks. Although, in the peace deal, the Taliban has pledged to prevent Afghanistan's territory under their control from being used by terrorist forces, this constant wave of attacks in Afghanistan has once again raised the concerns about the country's future. Whether it is political or social, Islamabad has muscled every resistance cropping up from the territory of illegally occupied Gilgit Baltistan. As if the military high-handedness for decades wasn't enough, the tyrannical civil establishment of Pakistan has introduced draconian legislations 
in order to legally unleash barbarity on civilians. Using Schedule 4 of the Anti-Terrorism Act, Pakistan has falsely implicated a large number of youths, predominantly the ones who dare to rise against its dubious policy towards the region. A report. The implementation of the draconian Schedule 4 of Anti-Terrorism Act in Gilgit, Baltistan has vigorously and persistently been resisted by activists and human rights groups in the past in Gilgit, Baltistan. The activists for the cause of Gilgit, Baltistan have often underscored the plight of the locals of the region who are being subjected to inhuman treatment by the security forces of the state. They highlight that laws are being misused to suppress any form of dissent simmering against the authoritarian rule of the establishment. Wajahat Hassan Mirza, the chairman of Gilgit Baltistan Thinkers Forum said that the suppressive design of Pakistan had proven to be successful as people were living in constant state of fear and had given up their demands for fundamental rights. That's why normal people, you know, uh, they get afraid of raising their voice. The tomorrow they might be put in uh, Schedule 4, which restrict their uh, movement. They can't attend any uh, political uh, gathering or uh, they have to get permission from police for moving one place to other place. The Schedule 4 of Anti-Terrorism Act was formulated to keep a vigil on those indirectly associated with the terrorist organizations or with a previous criminal record. However, it has presently been used to muzzle the reasonable voices of the region. The coalition of Pakistan Army and ISI has been systematically targeting the activists, traders, teachers and other pertinent people as it deems them a potential threat to their suppressive rule. They are arbitrarily arrested, detained, and sometimes even hacked to death on the pretext of homeland security. Their bank accounts are seized totally. Their property uh, is confiscated. So, so therefore you can well understand how difficult for the uh, political uh, people over there to raise their genuine voice for uh, political and economical rights. Baba Jan is one among the numerous cases of states growing atrocities in the region. An activist and a political worker, Jan, was sentenced to life imprisonment for campaigning against injustice and state oppression. The government of late has ramped up the use of Schedule 4 to ward off a potential dissent. Different statistics are suggestive of a rapidly deteriorating situation in the country. The besieged people are, however, using every arrow in their quiver to stage a strong resistance against Islamabad that has been extremely authoritarian in dealing with public issues in the region. The terror state of Pakistan has today been given this infamous title owing to the fact that it breeds and harbors some of the most dreaded terrorists in the world that carry out attacks in India and Afghanistan. An annual report published by Oxford has also criticized Pakistan and termed it more dangerous than Syria. Newsweek South Asia has a report. Known as the safe haven for terrorists, Pakistan has once again been exposed after an Oxford report termed it as three times riskier than Syria. The study was titled, Humanity at Risk, Global Terror Threats Indicant. The report states that in Pakistan, Afghan Taliban and the Lashkar-e-Taiba pose the maximum threat to international security and the world could be in grave danger if they are not controlled properly by the Pakistani government. The report also places Pakistan on top of the countries with the highest number of terrorist bases and camps, which provide training, weapons and other resources to the terror groups to spread mayhem in the world. 
Pakistan has been using terrorists for its strategic designs. Cross-border terrorism is being used to gain strategic depth in Afghanistan and in Kashmir. The terrorists are also being used to bleed India through thousand cuts to disrupt India's growing economy. Cross-border terrorism is being used in Iran as a Shia Sunni conflict. So as a policy, as a state policy, Pakistan has adopted terrorism. The Oxford report discusses in detail about the threat posed by Pakistan-sponsored terrorism across the world and it also mentions the rise in number of dangerous extremist groups originating and expanding its bases in Pakistan. The report also proves the fact that there are a significant number of terror groups in Afghanistan which operate with the support of Pakistan. Mentioning the rise of competitive extremism of all shades, the report talks about misuse of weapons of mass destruction and economic disruption that undermine human progress, something which is seen in Pakistan. Pakistan as a state encourages them. While other countries are fighting terrorism, Pakistan is promoting terrorism. Pakistan is the nursery of terrorists. Pakistan is a factory which not only produces terrorists, it trains them, even empowers them, gives them money, financially supports them, and then uses them to beat their strategic and national interests. Along with Oxford, Strategic Foresight Group a think tank that works on global issues had analyzed almost 200 groups actively involved in committing acts of terror in the past decade. During that period, the groups motivated by their own interpretation of jihadi ideology accounted for only a fourth of almost 200 groups around the world. Among these groups, Islamic State of Iraq and Syria ranked top on the list of deadliest terror groups in the world. But now, with swift rise and fall of ISIS, the Al-Qaeda remains the most resilient network. Al-Qaeda always has followed the pattern of amalgamating various terrorist groups and using them in various areas, various corners of the world to spread the influence of Al-Qaeda and their ideology like Al-Qaeda in South Asia, Al-Qaeda in Syria, Al-Qaeda in uh, uh, Africa like that there are so many uh, you know the offshoots of Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda central has basically been only an ideological fountainhead for them. So that is why the ISIS model it came like a bubble it has died on like a bubble, but Al-Qaeda continues to survive. The report also mentions that the infamous terror organization Al-Qaeda, which was responsible for the 9-11 terror attacks in New York, was born in Pakistan. It also mentions that the perpetrator and mastermind of the 9-11 attacks, Osama bin Laden was given a safe haven in a huge compound in Abbottabad, a very close to the Pakistani military establishment. Pakistan has been using terrorist forces like Taliban, the Hassan uh, uh, Akani network, Al Qaeda, and at times it has even supported ISIS elements in Afghanistan to fight against the indigenous Afghan forces. The report reaffirms that the jihadi thought process have proved to be most resilient in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Many extremist movements rose and collapsed, but the jihadi movement having survived in Pakistan and Afghanistan now firmly spreading to the Middle East and North and West Africa. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week.
with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Surbhi Sharma signing off on the behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.